it is time to hear some trail blazing founders as to how they view the potential and future of the Pakistani startup ecosystem. Hi everybody, welcome to the panel with the startups on why Pakistani startups are the next big thing. Uh, great to have you all over here. Uh, so as we know who's working, who are working in Pakistan, Pakistani startups have raised over $230 million already this year, which is more than 3.5 times what they raised last year. Um, and I'm really happy to say that amongst all of you, I think we have around between 180 to 200 million raised between the companies that we have over here today. So really exciting. Um, thank you for taking the time out and hopefully we'll have an interesting discussion. So diverse experiences, um, diverse uh, products and services that you guys are offering. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, asking a question that I'd like all of you to answer, which is what is the problem or the opportunity that you're looking to address or to solve? Um, and while you're doing it, what is the biggest challenge that you're seeing right now and how are you looking to address that challenge? So Kasif, I'll start with you. Uh, would you take, tell us a little bit about Finja? That would be great, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, look, Finja is a, is a digital lending platform uh, that focuses on MSMEs and their supply chains. And, you know, we, we have a few assets and one of them is that we've got multiple licenses. And these licenses allow us to operate like a digital bank uh, without any incumbent uh, dependence. And that's the secret of the fast execution that we do. Uh, you know, the other thing is that we don't compete with banks because we've got lending books for, of multiple banks and, you know, that allows us to uh, create the capital to lending. The other asset that we have is around partnerships that we've created with the FMCGs and with the distributors, sub-distributors, uh, stockists and mobilizers. And that allows us to lend against stock, uh, you know, to the merchants. And, you know, the problem that we're trying to solve is that Pakistan has, a, you know, very little lending done, two to three percent uh, lending in the country. And what we're trying to do is this, that we're trying to solve that problem. And already we are seven percent of the overall, uh, you know, lending loans to the SME in this country. In the last three months, we did about uh, one billion in excess of one billion uh, rupees of lending, which is seven million dollars. And in the next uh, three months, we're going to do 5 billion rupees, which is 30 to 35 million dollars of uh, uh, lending throughput. Uh, that's really what we are up to. Yeah. Great. And what, are some of the, what is the challenge that you're seeing coming down the road or that you're dealing with? Right the now? challenge is that, look, we are in 25 cities now and we've done, you know, under 100,000 uh, digital loans in total. The challenge is that we need to be in hundreds of cities in the next uh, next few months and you know we need to grow our uh, number of loans to to many x the size and Great. that's the challenge and an opportunity absolutely yeah. yes uh, hamza what about you and bazaar uh, thank you misbah thank you for having us thank you for giving bazaar this platform uh, bazaar is essentially an operating system for traditional retail in pakistan what that what does that mean is pakistan is a country which is dominated by traditional mom and pop convenience stores owner operated stores across every single category of groceries, fashion, electronics, pharma, etc. And so these stores are typically offline, but they are really the mass market or the middle of our economy. So Bazaar's idea is to start using the platforms they now have in their hand, which is a smartphone, to try and simplify their life and their business and help them grow and improve how they run their business. Uh, so a, a year ago, Bazaar started off with a simple product which would allow a grocery retailer to order about a thousand products uh, for their store, which we can, they can sell because that is something that they spend most of their time, their effort and their capital on. So a year ago, we started off with a B2B commerce product that would essentially allow that. And then a few months ago, we also launched a product called Easy Kata, which is a ledger product in the spirit of creating, you know, multiple digital products, which can, you know, solve different facets or different problems in that retailer's life and their business. And then the idea is to make an operating system where when a retailer wants to start their business, run their business, acquire products, acquire financial services, acquire software, 
um, th they are able to think of that and they think of Bazaar by doing that. And through that, they're able to grow their businesses uh, multiple folds um, versus what they could do before. I think the challenge in doing all of that, this large ambition is essentially of scale, right? We are in a market which is over $170 billion um, economy. So how fast can you have the maximum amount of impact? Which means that in a business like this, you have to be very efficient in scaling your operations, scaling your team, um, adopting, um, getting your customers to adopt the digital behaviors. So it's essentially the challenge of scale, of infrastructure, and how are you able to capture as much of the pie as possible uh, to really meaningfully add a few percentage points. Right. And I'm sure the percent. latest round you've raised is going to help towards that goal. That is the idea, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Sara, uh, we'll come to you next. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about Sehat Kahani? What have you done so far and what's the challenge you see coming down the line? Um, so the problem that we're solving through Sehat Kahani is basically uh, the problem of access to healthcare in Pakistan. 100 million people today in the country don't see a doctor ever in their lifetime, which means they might go to a quack or a midwife or a nurse, but going to a doctor is not possible for half of our population. And a big factor that feeds into it is a large population of female doctors not working. So data says that we have 85,000 doctor brides or non-working doctors in Pakistan, which is the majority of the medical workforce. Um, so we connect this cohort of female doctors to patients who need healthcare using a telemedicine solution so that people can access doctors virtually. Um, we've created a solution that works for different populations differently. So in low income communities, we do it through brick and mortar clinics where nurses are sitting and they connect the patient to an online doctor. Uh, for masters, we have a mobile app. And in that also, we have a corporate solution for corporate employers to provide telemedicine access to their employees through a B2B channel. And then we have a retail product as well that allows anyone, people like you and me, if ever we have a medical issue 24 seven, we can reach out to a doctor in less than 60 seconds. Uh, what we've uh, achieved so far is we've created the biggest network of telemedicine clinics in Pakistan, which are 35 clinics across the country in all four provinces. Um, we've had over half a million consultations through our application. Uh, we have the largest corporate network uh, using our app, which is 753 corporates through insurance providers and, in, and individual accounts. Um, I think saying that, um, if healthcare is an issue of 100 million people in Pakistan, and we've done half a million consultations to date, that's 0.5% of the total market. Um, so unless and until we have more people trying telemedicine as an alternative to physical care, and understanding the importance of reaching to a qualified doctor rather than a quack uh, for a country which is majorly run by quack providers or non-qualified health providers, we won't be able to see a long-term impact in the healthcare chain. Um, so our challenge is to get our app being used by a lot of people in a small amount of time. Right. So building awareness and customer adoption on the technology side. Great. Uh, Ahmad, we'll come to you next. Uh, what's happening with Chite and uh, what are some of the things you see coming down the road as a challenge? Thank you very much. Uh, so, so, you know, what we uh, attempted to solve was the now commerce problem, what we've called now commerce, which is instant fulfillment. So what we've done is we've built multiple verticals and inherently um, a broad based logistics fleet that can cater to those multiple verticals, whether they're our own or whether they're third party. And we do that through two vehicles. Chite is the more known B2C play that we do, but we also have Swift, which is more uh, the digitized version of the courier model, uh, which um, you know has digitized CO, the COD business. So, so that's you know how, how we've decided to you know sort of build the logistics fleet and solve the fulfillment problem through what we are calling now commerce. Um, people have talked about scale, so I won't mention scale again as a problem. The the big challenge that we're facing on the customer acquisition side is this discount driven economy. Right. Um, I don't want to say that our our consumers are discount seekers, but uh, I, I just said it. But anyway. Pakistanis love a bargain. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, we're always so, so for let's bargains. just let's just say they're price conscious, <laughs> right. right? So for price conscious people every discount is very valuable right and over the years as in every you know sort of third world market or frontier market what happens is that um, startups come offer huge discounts and you know and that's how they get people hooked and converted and you know do their customer acquisition so now we're left with or you know we're, we're facing people who just you know don't want to engage without that discount so for us solving that problem and creating real value and getting the unit economics to work without giving discounts and getting to the scale that, that you know, everyone is, is talking about is, I, I think, going to be a real challenge going Interesting. forward. Great. 
Uh, Mehra, we'll come to you next with Airlift. Uh, would love to hear a bit more about your story. Sure. Thanks for having us, uh, Ms. Ba. So with Airlift Express, we're looking to basically lay the groundworks of quick commerce in, in the developing world. And, uh, you know, as you've seen over the last 12 months, you know, there's been a global transformation when it comes to, you know, retail. And, you know, in terms of the next few years, we're seeing this, you know, sort of transformation being accelerated, especially, you know, in the in the developing world. You know, for example, right now, you know, eight out of 10 people, they prefer, you know, short, uh, sort of shop in store. Uh, over the next five years, you know, we see this being, you know, like, two out of 10 people maybe and you know the number is completely flipping so i think you know we want to lead that transformation in the in the developing world in the broader you know asia and africa region you know in the in the months and years to come uh, in terms of problems uh, or challenges i think you know uh, just you know by virtue of the pace at which uh, you know the business has scaled over the last 12 months um, i think one thing that has worked really well for us is you know attracting and sort of cultivating the right talent and you know going forward you know as we sort of you know expand our breadth and you know as we you know expand and, you know, uh, across continents, I think, you know, sort of maintaining and sort of, you know, sort of building that culture within the new teams. I think, you know, that comes across as the biggest challenge because, you know, we view that as a true competitive advantage. Yeah, I can see that. Great. And Malika? So AIMFIT is on a mission to make 110 million women in Pakistan believe that, yes, they can. On the surface, we offer fitness workouts across multiple programs that are accessible through our digital mediums. But what we're really in the business of doing is helping women overcome the physical and mental barriers that they set up for themselves. AIMFIT women have completed 25 million workout minutes to date. Wow. Um, we don't track uh, the payments that our members are giving us. Uh, we are instead obsessed with uh, you know, our North Star metric of how many workouts is everybody doing every month. And that number today is comparable to global benchmarks. Now, let's let that sink in for a minute, right? We look at the Olympic medal table for Pakistan, and then you look at the statistic of Pakistani women working out, and I think that's just incredible. That's great. And what's the challenge that you see coming in for AIMFIT? So fitness centers traditionally operate on a model where they rely on people paying them and not showing up. AIMFIT is disrupting this market, right? We are obsessed with how many workouts people actually do and the value that they receive from AIMFIT. Without subscription payments enabled end-to-end -end in Pakistan, which is a really big challenge right now, like Kaf is trying to solve, um, it's quite a challenge to continue to uh, have your uh, customers retained month on month. We see at Infit that still with, with, with this uh, ecosystem still not mature, people come back to us in their you know, fifth or sixth week after they've finished a, a month um, and manually sign up again. So a really big opportunity for AIMFIT is definitely subscription payments in the startup space um, that I think will just open a lot of doors for us. Great. And I think the work Kasif and others in the fintech space are doing is going to start helping all of the companies actually improve the experience that their customers are getting, improve, make seem payments more seamless, access to finance. So speaking of opportunities in, that Pakistan offers, I think two areas which often go unlooked or I have up till now is women as a target market and the mass market as well, rather than just the top uh, one to five percent of uh, people that have a higher spending power. So I'd like to ask this question generally to all of you. Maybe we can start with you, Sarah, and focus on the women aspect because you work with female doctors. A lot of your patients are female as well. How are you looking at the target, the, at this opportunity of women that Pakistan offers? I think because my, my business is directly uh, related to women as the entire supply chain that we have is made up of female doctors, I often get asked this question by female doctors only. Uh, I believe there's a huge opportunity um, in the medical workforce that is going absolutely untapped and underexplored, be it be female doctors or specialists um, or community health workers as well that can be utilized uh, to such a great level to solve this issue. But also on the, on the demand level, we've seen through our work that when there's a female who's taking a consultation and females are the main drivers for healthcare decisions in our families, even in the lower income or the lower tiered families, um, they really drive their family's attention towards adoption of the product. So they'll take it for themselves, then they'll bring their children, they'll bring their family members, they'll bring their husbands. This happens to us in our clinics as well as on a mobile application. 
Um, so we cater to around 60% women through our services. And women have a two out of four uh, return back rate as compared to a one out of four return back rate to a male customer. So I really believe that when it comes to healthcare or fintech, um, females can add as re real community champions or mobilizers that can get more people to try the service. And it's really proven true in mainly in the fintech industry. And I think we should really capitalize on that. Yeah, uh, and great uh, segue for you, Kasif. How does that? How are you looking at it on the fintech space? Look, it's it's become clear that you know women, whether whether they are housewives or whether they are professionals, and now if they are entrepreneurs, they just make for better credit risk, and you know they bring a a greater sense of responsibility to the table. Uh, they're very conscientious in the way they spend the money and then they take a lot of stress in making sure they have great credit. So uh, women, uh, women is a target market that we are looking at, uh, you know, to lend aggressively. It's great. And Malaka, you already mentioned that in terms of fitness and hours, Pakistani women are actually really kicking it. So uh, how do you see that growing now? And, and will, will women continue to be a focus of your business? Absolutely. Like, so the demand for female only um, workouts that are localized in Pakistan for women is huge. Like we see investors excited by that, uh, you know, localized opportunity a lot. Um, and I think that... Um, so what was the second part of your question? No, that was it, that there's an opportunity that, you know, that, that women can, can yeah, be targeted absolutely. and, and build, you can build a biz, business around. Yeah, absolutely. Women. Like we see, you know, Pakistan, like members of Aimford right now are paying us a, a higher subscription than Peloton is charging in America. Wow. And that is for the localized tailored experience that they're getting. So absolutely the opportunity is huge. Great. And so I guess coming to the broader question then of mass market, it's all about tailoring your products, like you said, to what people want in and what are they, where are the gaps? So, so uh, Hamza, how is Bazaar looking at targeting the mass market? How are you getting out to people that have not been uh, touched potentially by some of these services before? Yeah, so I think um, we're a country of 220 million people. And of course, it, there is a journey to touch each of that life. So we've taken um, an approach where can we see that in, in our social construct, in our economy, if you look at a grocery retailer, they have about 100 to 300 people or households or consumers walk into a small grocery store in Karachi or Lahore, which means that if you are bringing a dollar value or convenience or disruption to that grocery store, indirectly you're touching hundreds of lives that way. And so for us, that is the mass market today. And if we are able to digitize this corner store traditional retailer, in effect, we're actually affecting hundreds of lives. And the other thing we've seen is the way to digitize this market is, is like Malik mentioned, the localized tailor approaches, right? So um, we at startups look at a lot of global benchmarks and emerging market benchmarks, and we try to do pattern matching as well. But there's also a huge case for how much can you tailor and bring the local nuances and how you're developing your product, your experience, your value proposition, um, even the language, your content, branding, etc. So at Bazaar, uh, when we launched the commerce product, we've made sure that app is as simple as possible. If you can use WhatsApp, which most of the mass market who are digitally en enabled in Pakistan can use, you should be able to use the Bazaar app as well. And similarly with Easy Khata. Great. Um, and so Meher, coming to, uh, to Airlift and Airlift Express, uh, you're actually looking at getting to customers directly, right? And so how is that, how is that helping you reach people that otherwise potentially earlier were not being uh, access were not accessible? Uh, so it's a great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, we started Airlift, you know, two and a half years back with the sort of goal of creating self-empowerment, you know, first with our, you know, mobility uh, vertical and now with quick commerce. So, so I think, you know, um, it, it is basically centered around self-empowerment and agency in the way that, you know, people who had to, you know, first, you know, walk out of their houses, you know, women, you know, elders, they, they now, you know, have everything available, you know, in the in the palm of, the, of their hand. So I think, you know, that's how we sort of, you know, view this, this uh, sort of transformation and this transition from, you know, offline to online and, you know, bringing everything, you know, sort of at your fingertips. And I think, you know, that's, that's sort of, you know, what we want to, uh, you know, accelerate Pakistan's path towards. And, you know, uh, whoever has a smartphone, whoever, you know, has access to internet, you know, has access to all these things. So I think, you know, that's what's most exciting about uh, about what we're building. Great. And then from quick commerce to now commerce, Emma, have you seen a, a change in that adoption in, after COVID and have things sped up in no, that ab space? Absolutely. Like the joys of, uh, you know, operating a marketplace are, are such that 
you know, you have the riders on one end who you're trying to digitize. So now all the riders have apps as, as you know, with them. Um, and then you have the vendors like who you need to digitize because you don't want to be calling them up to place orders. So now they're digitized. And then obviously you have all your customers because the only way for them to place an order is through the app. And, you know, we have over 100 million uh, apparently smartphone users now in the market. So what? So the, the way the marketplace works is, you know, if, if someone wants to start their own uh, business, we are there and we're like, okay, let's digitize you. Let's grow your income. If you want to be a rider and again, use that to grow your income. And then ultimately, you know, you, you get to an income level where you become the customer. So it's the beauty of, of interconnecting everything, right? On one hand, you know, you're helping people make money. On the other hand, you're helping them spend money uh, and, you know, get value for money, whether it's, you know, through better deals, through uh, cost efficiencies where, where, you know, you can offer better pricing. Yeah. So, it's, so uh, I'm being told we're running out of time, but we'll go a few minutes uh, over. Um, so Hamza, I'm going to ask you, like, as you've just recently raised your round and, and I'll come to you after this, Meher, what are some of the things that you're hearing investors, both local and foreign, ask you uh, in terms of like, what do they know about, what do they want to know about your business or Pakistan? And what has been something that either has surprised you or has surprised uh, investors that you have been able to tell them about the country? Yeah, I think I'll come to surprise first. The biggest surprise has been when a year ago when we, when we were raising a pre-seed round to now raising a Series A, how the narrative has completely changed so quickly. And so earlier, a year ago, people would you know, ask about Pakistan, the fundamentals of the market, about security, about politics, about talent. But now in this Series A, I think it was more and more about the fundamentals of the opportunity, how big the market is, what is your approach. So now we're very close to playing a level field across all of the emerging markets. So we have now sort of surpassed that conscious bias, especially an international investor would have, all right, you know, Pakistan is something unfamiliar to them. Um, and with past one year, I mean, you look at Airlift, you look at Chite, you look at Finja, we've now all raised essentially money primarily from international investors. And a lot of people are now making their first bets into Pakistan. And once they make their first bet, a number of follow on bets come through. So we're all trying to sort of change that narrative together. But Alhamdulillah, so far, that narrative has changed very, very quickly. Um, and when you talk about what are they asking about, they're really interested in, all right, how is the digital penetration increasing? Do you have the right talent base to build the kind of ambition you want to go after? Does the market have enough fundamentals and juice for you to sort of, you know, respond to um, the digital disruption that might happen? And then does the macroeconomic condition support it? Earlier, you would ask, where will you get your Series B or where will the exit come from? Those questions are no longer being asked. The capital constraint or that bias is now being very, very quickly removed. And we're now at that level playing field of, you know, competing with a Silicon Valley a startup and in a Pakistani startup, we're talking to similar funds, similar questions and similar uh, the uh, size of the opportunity. That's great. Um, and Meher, at Airlift, I'm assuming you've seen something similar in terms of the investor interest? Uh, uh, yeah. So so I think, you know, uh, in our experience, um, uh, you know, the scarcity, it, it uh, doesn't lie, you know, in terms of capital. I think it's more around, you know, the talent and traction. Uh, so, you know, in our conversations with investors, you know, both global and local, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of excitement around the team that's executing on the ground. And I think that's what, you know, most of them bet on. And that's what, you know, they, they get most excited about and I think that reflects in you know what what the organization or company is able to achieve you know in any given time so so I think you know it's it's been phenomenal I think you know uh, it, it, it sort of you know also breeds confidence into into the Pakistani market into into local talent and I think you know that was something you know that perhaps you know we wouldn't have expected you know when engaging with you know big names you know globally so so I yeah. think you know th that has definitely been uh, that's been great so I guess we can all agree that Pakistani startups are the next big thing <laughs> there's no question mark at the end of this uh, title so i guess we're all on the same track How thank you for you your time that word next and become the big the big thing, big uh. thing. <laughs> um thank you all for your time it's been great talking with you uh, very short but uh, i'm glad we were able to have a chat thank thanks. You so much. thanks for having thank us you. thank you